This is the best of our knowledge. I'm Bob Barrett. Today, we think nothing of seeing kids bringing laptops and iPads into the classroom. But there have been attempts at creating so-called teaching machines since the early 20th century. And it's the history of those early teaching machines that Audrey Waters explores in her new book. It's called Teaching Machines, The History of Personalized Learning. Audrey Waters is an education technology writer and creator of the blog Hack Education. I asked why she took on the history of these teaching machines. I have been interested for a very long time in the history of education technology, you know, sort of how we got to this particular moment, and which seems particularly with the pandemic, right, to be very stark the ways in which computers are, are used in the classroom. And I was very interested in the ways in which as well that Silicon Valley entrepreneurs tend to talk about their work as being innovative and brand new and no one's ever thought of this or done this before. And I was interested in telling a different story, the story of the the people who built teaching machines, who built these machines that were very similar, I think, to what happens today and that have been working on them for almost 100 years. There are so many ways I would like to start this conversation, but I'm going to go right to the pigeons. What do pigeons have to do with this story? B.F. Skinner was, in the 20th century, probably one of the most famous public intellectuals of his time. He was a psychologist, a professor at Harvard, and he worked on pigeons, worked with pigeons in his lab. He created a theory called behaviorism, in which he argued that the way in which you could study learning, teaching and learning, was by studying behaviors. And he was particularly keen on changing the behavior of pigeons. So he would train pigeons to do things. uh, They could play ping pong, for example. They could play the piano. And headlines like love to talk about how smart the pigeons at Harvard were. Uh, But Skinner was also interested in how we taught humans and the same theories and the same practices that he believed applied to pigeons, he said applied to humans as well. And so when he decided to build teaching machines for humans, he was building machines that worked very similar to the way in which he trained pigeons, which is by offering them rewards for doing the right thing. In the book, you have a photograph of Skinner's first teaching machine. What did that machine do? So Skinner, there's a story that he would tell, and it's, I think if if Skinner were alive today, it would be his TED Talk. He talked about the ways in which the typical classroom operates. One day he said he visited his daughter's fourth grade class, and he was watching the students in a math lesson. And he noticed that some students moved through the questions very quickly, and then they were bored. Uh, Some students really struggled and they weren't able to finish the lesson by the time the allotted 45 minutes were over. And then the teacher, you know, collected the work and took it home and would grade it and give it back the next day. And for Skinner, this practice of teaching really violated so many of his theories about how people best learn. He believed that people needed positive reinforcement immediately, for example. And he wanted to come up with a way in which students could move at their own pace through lessons. So he went home and he built a little box in which a student would get one question at a time and then they would fill in the blank with their answer and then check their answer. And if they got it right, the reward would be they could move on to the next question. And so that was sort of the basis for his ideas about how we would automate this kind of practice so that people could move through lessons at their own place. And you start the book with Skinner's story, but really Skinner is not where this begins. You had someone way before Skinner doing this kind of work. Tell us about Sidney Pressey. Dear Sidney Pressey, Sidney Pressey was a professor at the Ohio State University. Uh, In the 1920s, he came up with a very similar idea. He built a machine, a prototype of a machine from old typewriter parts. And Sidney Pressey used the multiple choice test. So uh, the students could would press a key to, uh, to choose the right answer. He even had an additional option for his machine that if the student got the right answer, they could get a piece of candy. 
Uh, but Sydney Pressy ran into a lot of problems, least of which was, of course, the Great Depression, uh, which made the demand for uh, teaching machines, budgets for schools to be something that he just couldn't overcome. He struggled for a very long time to commercialize his machine, but to no avail. Yeah, neither of these guys made any money on their machines, did they? I would say that, you know, B.F. Skinner made quite a bit of money as a consultant trying to build his machine, but they were, neither of them were successful. But there were companies that were successful. This was a very popular idea in the late 50s, early 1960s. In fact, encyclopedia sales, people would go door to door. And if you bought a set of encyclopedias, they would throw in a, a teaching machine as well. And it was, you know, if you think about it, it was, you know, this was around the time of Sputnik, Americans were very concerned about what was happening with education. It was also a time of, you know, the post-war boom. People were really interested in gadgets and this idea that there could be machines that would make American children, that, you know, learn better, faster, be smarter than the Russians was pretty powerful. They're called teaching machines, but actually when you look at the way they operate, they were just testing machines, weren't they? In many ways, they were just testing machines. And so as I was researching the book, I went on eBay and I, I bought myself one. I wanted to test out what, what it felt like, what it, what, what, it, what it was like to use one of these machines. And I would say not only are they simply sort of testing machines, but the drudgery of moving through the material was something else. And I think that that's important to remember. We often talk about how excited children are when they get new gadgets in the classroom. You recall, you know, a decade ago, how iPads were going to change everything and kids loved having iPads. Um, But after a while, I think students recognize that worksheets are worksheets and that this work isn't particularly exciting, whether it's on a plastic teaching machine or on a, you know, $500 iPad, It, it tends to still be rather dull work. Did you at least get a machine that gave you candy? I did not get a machine that gave me candy, oh, no. unfortunately. Oh, no. <laughs> Have teachers ever embraced these machines? Some, you know, I think that some teachers did embrace them. I think that there were several pilots in which students and teachers, for a short time at least, seemed to enjoy it. Many students, for example, would say that they really liked the ability to move at their own pace through the material. And some teachers liked the idea of being able to actually just focus on the students who were struggling rather than um, having to uh, you know, talk to a whole class and then sort of, again, ascertain later how students were, were progressing. But I don't think that these were as popular in schools for a variety of reasons than they were as sort of a, a gadget that you would buy and use at home. Partially because I think then as now, it was a huge expenditure for schools. Uh, Schools were kind of balked at the idea of making sure that every student had a device. That sounds pretty familiar. Well, they didn't want to buy these things while they were still paying teachers, right? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. There is one uh, one passage in the uh, in the conclusion of the book it says teaching machines may then be one of the most important trends in the 20th century, both in education and in technology, precisely because they were not a flash in the pan, as some scholars suggested, but a harbinger. Were they a harbinger for computers? I think they were. Often when people tell the story of teaching machines, they're sort of used as a prologue to then talk about the ways in which computers came along and then computers changed everything. But what I wanted to argue are these theories, and particularly B.F. Skinner's theories around behaviorism, really did become, excuse the the pun, I guess, hard-coded into the kind of practices that were built into early computers and that were that are, remain in ed tech today. If you look at a lot of the things that students are asked to do with today's teaching machines, you'll find that they're very, very similar to the kinds of things that, that Skinner and even, even Sidney Pressy were imagining students to do almost a century ago. Um, and the promises are still the same. You know, students will be able to move at their own pace, for example, is something that you you hear a lot that will that teachers will be able to understand uh, students better because they'll have more data on what students know and, and don't know. So I think that rather than just being something that 
happened in the 50s and then went away and were replaced by, uh, replaced by computers, rather the kinds of things that teaching machines did, the kinds of educational practices and technology practices that the teaching machines offered really became what we see, what we see in ed tech still today. Has the past 18 months of COVID made people think, you know, we better perfect these things even more? I think that's the sales pitch that schools are certainly getting. I think that in one way, we can look back at the last you know, year and a bit and say, like once again, the promises of ed tech are really overblown. This idea that you're going to be able to give a student a device and they'll be able to sort of um, work through things on their own or work through materials, they'll stay engaged, they'll want to participate, they'll feel motivated to sort of move on to the next lesson, for example. I think we know that that's simply not, not true. I think that we miss, students miss teachers, teachers miss students, but they also miss one another. And I think that that's another part of the teaching machines. These are very isolating devices. It's, it's you and your teaching machine. It's you and your iPad, you and your computer working through a list of questions. That's very different than being in the kind of social space of a classroom. I mean, I think that there are ways in which tech entrepreneurs want to make things flashier. They'll change the graphics a little, They're, they'll add new bells and whistles. But really that community, that communal social aspect isn't something that they can engineer into a teaching machine, even with Zoom, even with the internet. I think that these devices are very individualized. And of course, that's part of their promise. Personalized learning is about the individual. But so much of what students learn in school has to do with learning how to socially interact. And a machine can never do that, can it? A machine, I don't think, will ever be able to do that, no. Audrey Waters is an education technology writer and creator of the blog Hack Education. The name of her new book is Teaching Machines, the History of Personalized Learning. You can learn more at hackeducation.com. Still to come, we stay on the topic of machines, this time with machine learning. That's next on The Best of Our Knowledge. Got any questions or comments about the best of our knowledge? Send them in. Our email address is knowledge at wamc.org. And if you'd like to listen to this or any past programs again, you can find them online at our flagship station's website. Just go to wamc.org and click on the programs link. And while you're there, subscribe to the Best of Our Knowledge's podcast or download the WAMC radio app to listen on demand anytime, any place. This is the best of our knowledge. I'm Bob Barrett. So after a discussion about the history of teaching and learning machines, we thought it would be a good idea to take another look at machine learning. It's a very different thing. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are two terms that were coined in the 1950s, but only now beginning to be put to solving practical problems. In the past few years, machine learning algorithms have been used to automate the interpretation and analysis of clinical chemistry data in a variety of situations in the lab. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, labs could use all the help they can get. In the September 2020 issue of the journal Clinical Chemistry, there is a paper on a machine learning approach for the automated interpretation of amino acids profiles in human plasma. The same issue contains an accompanying editorial titled Machine Learning for the Biochemical Genetics Laboratory. One of the authors of that editorial is Dr. Stephen Master, Chief of the Division of Laboratory Medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and an Associate Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine of the University of Pennsylvania. I asked Dr. Master, first of all, what exactly is machine learning and why would it be significant for the clinical laboratory? Well, machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence that uses computer algorithms that can learn from data. 
So for example, if I want to predict a model of whether someone is going to buy a product, I might want to create a model based on their age, their income, their internet browsing history, or a number of other factors that might reflect how attractive that product would be to them. To create that kind of a model using machine learning, I would start with a set of training data that had all of the relevant information about a group of people along with whether they had purchased the product. And the algorithm would then tune the parameters of the model in a way that tries to maximize its ability to make correct predictions. And I could then test that machine learning model by taking data from a new group of people and seeing how well the model predicted whether they would purchase the product. So I've given you a common commercial example, but the same type of approach has been applied in a number of healthcare settings. And anatomic pathologists, just to pick one example, have really aggressively explored the use of machine learning to automatically identify concerning areas of tissue slides. Now, in the clinical laboratory, we generate a tremendous amount of quantitative patient data on a daily basis. And so it's natural to think that machine learning provides a powerful tool to add interpretive value to the work we do. That is to integrate patterns of lab values and other medical data into models that predict disease or prognosis in patients. Well, I mentioned earlier that the September 2020 issue of Clinical Chemistry contains a report describing the use of machine learning to analyze amino acid profiles in the Biochemical Genetics Laboratory. What is new with this approach and why is it important? Well, when you think about applications of machine learning to laboratory medicine, one obvious area would be the Biochemical Genetics Laboratories. And there are two specific reasons that I say this. The first is that these labs diagnose and manage inborn errors of metabolism using assays such as plasma and urine amino acid profiles, urine organic acids, or acylcarnitine profiles. And each of these assays that I just mentioned shares the characteristic that one test measures a significant number of different compounds in the patient. And that means not only that there's a lot of data generated for each patient, but also, just as importantly, that the patients who get these tests can be easily compared. So unlike some other laboratory results, you can imagine where one patient might have gotten one set of tests and another patient might have gotten a different set of tests, every patient who gets these particular tests that we're talking about should have a large set of comparable data. And the second reason why I think the Biochemical Genetics Lab is a particularly interesting area in which to apply machine learning is that interpreting complex assays, such as amino acid profiles, requires a fair degree of training and skill. And the amino acid profiles alone, there are over 50 known disorders that can be reflected in these results, and some of them can be difficult to spot. So traditionally, this means that an expert interpretation is always performed when reporting these results. When you think about it, though, finding subtle patterns in complex data sets is something that machine learning can sometimes do quite well. So I think that one of the significant aspects of the work in this paper is that it has begun to address the question, can we use machine learning to aid augment, or even replace the work of the traditional human laboratorian in interpreting amino acid profiles. So what are the particular challenges when using machine learning in these types of applications? Well, I've discussed the fact that successful machine learning relies on having a very good training data set, and the more data, the better. Beyond that, it's not enough just to have data and known diagnoses for training. It's also important to have a second or even a third independent data set that can be used to tune the performance of the machine learning algorithm and to independently validate how well it performs as a predictor. So without sufficient data and the right data, even the best machine learning algorithm won't perform well. And I would say in my experience, getting the data that you need is probably the main challenge. What about the situation with relatively rare diseases? How can you gather sufficient data for the machines to adequately learn? Well, that's a, that's a great question. As you can imagine, if it's difficult to connect, collect a, a enough data for common diseases, it's even harder to collect enough data for rare diseases. And you can see that the authors of this current paper really wrestled with that issue. So even though they were able to amass a fairly sizable cohort, over 2,000 cases actually, they were still forced to group a number of very rare, diverse conditions into what they called rare inherited metabolic disease as a category simply because of the very small number of positives. And then in order to prove that the classifier was robust, they used a small group of external quality assurance specimens that represented a subset of the diseases that they wanted to classify. And I don't say this to take anything away from their work, actually. I think it just shows the challenges of doing this with rare conditions. I actually think there are several approaches that might be helpful here, but I think that the best strategy for the field, honestly, is likely to involve getting biochemical genetics labs to create larger consortia that share patient data and therefore get a better representation of some of these rare conditions. Well, what about the risks of using machine learning algorithms? How can a lab ensure that their results are accurate? 
Well, any time that we talk about using a diagnostic algorithm, it raises very important issues that we have to think about with respect to patient safety and, and even liability. The current discussion goes back at least a decade, and it led to some very specific recommendations by the U.S. Institute of Medicine in 2012 regarding how to validate the performance of these types of machine learning models. So I think it's worth stating clearly that any lab that's thinking of implementing a machine learning model should make sure that they really, really understand the best practices, pitfalls, and issues surrounding correct validation. But when, when thinking specifically about risk, though, I have to say that I think that one really interesting idea is the paradigm of using these types of tools to augment rather than replace human diagnosticians. Uh, so in the case of amino acids, a model that could reliably tell you that a profile looks normal would still be useful in helping to triage the cases that a human should examine more carefully, even if it couldn't necessarily identify every single rare disorder on its own. Does this type of technology have any role to play in the current situation we're going through, the current pandemic, or something similar to it? I think that's a really interesting thought. I mean, certainly uh, when we think about the possible applications of machine learning, uh, you could start to try and predict patient outcome. One of the things that we know is that we don't really understand a lot about why it is that patients always do well or poorly. And certainly some of those characteristics have been identified, but probably not all of them. And I think that that would be a natural place for machine learning, potentially using laboratory data to be of use. If you had a laboratory training set where you then looked at a patient and, and saw what their um, outcome was from a COVID perspective, you might then be able to use that in the future to look at a patient who was coming into the hospital and to predict how severe their disease course was going to be. Of course, that's to a certain degree speculative, and this is a field that's moving very quickly. But I think that those are the kinds of places that we could think about applying machine learning um, in a laboratory context for our current pandemic. Well, let's look ahead. What do you foresee as the future for this type of approach in the next five, even 10 years? How should clinical laboratorians think about the significance of machine learning for their future practice? Yeah, I think that it is inevitable that these approaches will become more and more important throughout healthcare and particularly in laboratory medicine context. Um, the reality is that it isn't a question of whether they'll be developed and used, but rather who is going to develop them and use them. And that's where I actually feel very strongly that we in the laboratory medicine community, not just in biochemical genetics, as we've been discussing, but more broadly across lab medicine, need to make sure that we're involved. Um, there are important characteristics of our data that can affect machine learning. And those characteristics may not always be apparent from outside the clinical lab. So I really think that we want to drive this as a field to make sure that the models that are created using laboratory data are well-designed and appropriate for patient care. And frankly, that's why I'm delighted that the study we've been discussing today has been published in Clinical Chemistry, because I think it reflects the exciting kinds of work that can result when recent developments in machine learning are combined with solid laboratory medicine. Dr. Stephen Master is an associate professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. His editorial appears in the September 2020 issue of the journal Clinical Chemistry. Okay, so we've done some deep dives into teaching machines and machine learning. Let's go for the hat trick and take on virtual reality. That's the topic of today's Academic Minute. Virtual reality is here, but does it work for everyone? I'm Dr. Lynn Pascarella, president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And today on the Academic Minute, Boss Rokers, associate professor of psychology at NYU Abu Dhabi, examines the science behind the tech. What if you could walk into a room full of strangers and see names and other relevant details floating above everyone's head? Augmented reality can make such a world possible. The technology may soon be built into glasses, for example, so that virtual content can be superimposed on our view of the real world. Engineers are close to solving the many challenges involved in augmented reality. At the same time, however, our understanding of the conditions under which our brains can or cannot take advantage of the additional information is relatively limited. In a recent study at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and New York University Abu Dhabi, we manipulated the virtual content displayed. We found that under naturalistic viewing conditions, the brain exploits small involuntary head movements, which we call head jitter, to improve visual perception. For augmented reality devices to work well, therefore, they should record your head jitter 
and update the virtual content accordingly. As an important aside, we found that commonly available virtual reality headsets do not work well for a large fraction of the population. Specifically, some popular headsets provide a poor fit to women. As a result, females tend to report a poorer visual experience and greater motion sickness. Our work informs the design of new virtual and augmented reality devices and may help us better understand the neural mechanisms that are disrupted in perceptual disorders. That was Bas Rokers of NYU Abu Dhabi. You can find this, other segments, and more information about the professors at academicminute.org. The Academic Minute is a production of WAMC, Northeast Public Radio, in partnership with the Association of American Colleges and Universities. That's all the time we have for this week's program. If you'd like to listen again, join us online at our flagship station's website. Go to wamc.org and click on the programs link. While you're there, subscribe to our podcast or any of the other WAMC or National Productions podcasts. And if you have any questions or comments about the program, send them in. Our email address is knowledge at wamc.org. And you can find us on Twitter at TBOO Knowledge. I'm Bob Barrett. Be sure to join us next time for another edition of The Best of Our Knowledge. Bob Barrett is producer of The Best of Our Knowledge. Dr. Alan Shartok is executive producer. The Best of Our Knowledge is a production of WAMC Radio's National Productions, which is solely responsible for its content. Hear more at wamc.org.